Hypersonic missiles don't make much sense. I mean, they do and they don't. While most claims about hypersonic missiles are totally overhyped, one claim is the real deal. It has to do with the word hypersonic, which means traveling at speeds exceeding five times the speed of sound. As it turns out, five is actually a magic number. But the more you look into the physics of hypersonic flight, the more you realize that hypersonics is the technology of the future and will always be. That's not my line. It was in fact a running joke among the Air Force engineers who developed the X-51 Wave Rider, an experimental aircraft capable of hypersonic flight. But there is lots of truth to that joke, because creating a hypersonic missile involves solving some extremely difficult problems. The funny part is that even after solving all those problems and building a reliable hypersonic missile, its utility is really questionable. Which begs the question, why build a hypersonic missile to begin with? A hypersonic missile travels between Mach 5 and Mach 25. Traveling at such high speeds would allow a hypersonic missile, hypersonic glide vehicle or a hypersonic aircraft to outrun all enemy air defenses, making it practically invulnerable. Hypersonic weapons in general are harder to counter than traditional rockets because they can travel fast for extensive periods of time and are maneuverable. This makes them less predictable than traditional ballistic missiles. Basically, the narrative goes that with hypersonic weapons, you can do whatever you want over enemy airspace and there is nothing they can do about it. At least that's the idea, but we are yet to see it in practice. And no, the Russian Kinjal hypersonic missiles don't count, and we'll get to that too. So why hypersonic? Why Mach 5? Why not Mach 4 or Mach 6? While it may not matter to a hypersonic glide vehicle, the Mach 5 is a magic number for a hypersonic cruise missile because of the type of engine used. There are various types of engines and each works best at a particular speed. Turbojets use a series of large fans to draw air into the engine and pressurize it. This pressurized air is then mixed with fuel at subsonic speeds and ignited. The exhaust that leaves the engine creates thrust, which pushes the engine forward. The advantage of turbojets is that they can start up from a stationary position. But the downside is that they're most efficient at subsonic speeds. Turbojets start losing efficiency at transonic speeds, with not much utility above Mach 3. Ramjets eliminate the fan and use their forward momentum and shape to intake air from outside, slow it down to subsonic speeds and pressurize it. Fuel is then injected and ignited, which generates thrust. But for a ramjet engine to work, it has to be already moving. Theoretically, ramjets can start at Mach 0.15, realistically at Mach 0.5, but they only reach their full efficiency at around Mach 3. Their theoretical maximum operational speed is Mach 6, and that's due to shockwave-induced pressure loss. Finally, scramjet works the same way as ramjet, with the key difference being that scramjet doesn't slow down the air to subsonic speeds before mixing in the fuel. This allows scramjet to operate more efficiently than ramjet at higher speeds. In fact, scramjets are capable of the highest possible propulsion speeds, all the way up to Mach 24. While it might have the most simple design among all these engine types, it comes at a cost. The scramjet can only start operating at about Mach 5. Depending on altitude and the atmospheric conditions, it could start at Mach 4.5 also. Since scramjet can only operate at high speeds, it would have to be boosted up, either by a rocket or dropped from an airplane such as a B-52. But here's the thing, while scramjet might look simple, in reality it's incredibly hard to get it to work. Scramjets have been in development for the past 70 years. The issue is that everything is happening incredibly fast inside the engine at hypersonic speed. In a matter of milliseconds, the right amount of fuel has to mix with air at the right pressure to create the magical scenario of a sustainable combustion cycle. 
even more difficult is to make the whole process reliable. But if scramjets are so difficult to operate, why not just use rockets? Great question. And yes, you can use rockets that fly at hypersonic speed. The world's first long-range ballistic missile, the German V-2, was actually able to reach speeds greater than Mach 5 for a brief period of time during ascent. Modern ballistic missiles, such as the Russian Iskandar, can reach speeds of up to Mach 7 in the stratosphere. Intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, reach speeds of over Mach 20 while cruising in space. But there are two problems with ballistic missiles predictability and efficiency. Once a ballistic missile's rocket engine burns out, the payload is basically coasting at a set trajectory, making it easier to intercept as the payload slows down from hypersonic to supersonic speeds. In fact, a great advantage of hypersonic glide vehicles over ballistic missiles is their ability to maneuver while in flight, making them less predictable which poses a great problem for missile defense systems. I recently came across a story that Iran announced it too had built a hypersonic ballistic missile, but it was interesting how some news outlets were using different headlines to cover it, thanks to Ground News, an app and website that I've been using to stay fully informed on breaking news as it's happening around the world, and they are sponsoring this video. This particular story on Iran has 92 sources reporting on it, with 56% of the sources from right-leaning outlets, making this a potential blind spot for the left. Scrolling down, I can see all the news sources and compare headlines from left, center, and right-leaning outlets. For example, WND, a far-right source with low factuality, headlines this as Iran claims to have built hypersonic ballistic missiles. While the Daily Mirror, a left-leaning source with mixed factuality reports, headlines the story as Iran built unstoppable hypersonic missile that can fly five times speed of sound. It's really helpful to see it visualized this way, where a single word or phrase can alter our understanding of a story. Ground News aggregates over 50,000 sources in one place, so we can compare coverage, see factuality and ownership of sources reporting on topics like this. I also like that I can filter by factuality of the source and click in to read each article from its original source. Ground News has become my go-to source and I highly encourage you to check it out at ground.news slash nwyt for free or subscribe for unlimited access to support this channel and a small team of media outsiders looking to hold media accountable and fully inform readers to empower critical thought. The second problem with ballistic missiles or rockets in general is efficiency or lack thereof. This is why we don't use rockets to fly from New York to London and never will. Yeah, I said it. Because it would be inefficient. Missiles and vehicles that are powered by air-breathing engines are much more efficient in transporting a payload from point A to point B than rockets are. Air-breathing means that the engine uses oxygen from the atmosphere as an oxidizer as opposed to rockets that carry their own oxidizer and don't rely on external oxygen. Depending on the exact model, cruise missiles can be 20 to 30 times more efficient than rockets. How so? It has to do with specific impulse. Specific impulse is a measure of how effectively an engine generates thrust. Let's say you have an engine where one pound of fuel creates one pound of thrust for 200 seconds. The higher the specific impulse number, the higher the efficiency. For modern rockets, the specific impulse measure ranges from 200 to about 450 seconds. Compare that to a scramjet, which can have a maximum value of specific impulse of 4,000 seconds. The bottom line is that air-breathing jet engines typically have a much larger specific impulse than a rocket, making them much more efficient than rockets. This translates to longer range, larger payload, and higher constant velocity cruise in the atmosphere compared to the smaller range and variable velocity of ballistic missiles. Nevertheless, ballistic missiles still have a speed advantage compared to subsonic and supersonic cruise missiles, which makes them harder to intercept. A true hypersonic missile could only be powered by a scramjet engine, not rockets. Otherwise, the German V-2 can also qualify as a hypersonic missile. 
But besides problems with developing a scramjet engine, there are many other issues with hypersonic flight. First of all, the missile travels so fast that it compresses the air molecules to the point that they turn into plasma. The missile becomes a large glowing object which can be detected by visible and infrared sensors, even from space. The claims of plasma stealth is nothing short of an urban myth because hypersonic missiles can be easily tracked by modern radars. Furthermore, a recent Air Force Institute of Technology study found that plasma sheath is primarily reflective. The second issue is communications blackout at hypersonic speeds. Similar to a space shuttle experiencing communication blackout during its return to Earth, a hypersonic missile is unable to send or receive communications. This is because plasma sheath blocks radio frequencies. On top of that, the hypersonic missile will be totally blind since it cannot use any visual or infrared sensors in front of the missile because they would simply melt. Finally, the biggest problem is heat. Traveling at Mach 5 would heat up the missile to anywhere from 3200 to 4000 degrees Fahrenheit, which makes you wonder, how do they prevent the missile from melting? Because the silica tiles used on space shuttles won't work, as it would create a lot of aerodynamic problems. One solution is to make a missile with double walls, where fuel acts as a coolant. Currently, the issue of heat is partially mitigated by flying the hypersonic missile really high up, somewhere between 65,000 to 130,000 feet, where the air density and temperatures are a fraction of what they are at sea level. This brings us to the grand finale on why hypersonic missiles don't actually make much sense. And here is what I mean. In order to approach its target on the ground, the hypersonic missile would have to come down to the warmer and denser atmosphere, where it would simply melt down like a meteorite. To prevent the melting, the missile would have to slow down to speeds similar to conventional missiles. And this is where hypersonic missiles stop making sense. A conventional ballistic missile travels at an average speed of Mach 2.2 up to a maximum speed of Mach 3 during its terminal phase. Remember the magic number? It wasn't 3, it was 5. This means that the scramjet engine on the missile won't work at Mach 3. So during its terminal phase, the no longer hypersonic missile is flying unpowered just like a ballistic missile. There will be some degree of maneuverability using small fins and gas agents to help change its course as it plunges down. But the point I'm trying to make is that during its final approach, a hypersonic missile would present the same level of threat to modern surface-to-air missile systems that a ballistic missile like the Russian Iskander would do. Of course, for now, hypersonic missiles cannot be intercepted during their mid-course phase when they actually fly hypersonic. And yes, they reduce the reaction time available to the other side to make a call to intercept. But if you're a high-value target like an aircraft carrier, no matter the reaction time window, all attempts to intercept would be made during the terminal phase. It's really hard to find any reasonable explanation beside the American prompt global strike capability which aims to provide a precision-guided conventional weapon airstrike anywhere in the world within one hour. Basically the same as the nuclear ICBM does. So what's the point of even developing hypersonic missiles? It is theoretically possible for a hypersonic missile to go to 90,000 feet, fly at Mach 24, travel 7,500 miles in 24 minutes, and hit some cave where ISIS leaders are having a meeting. That would be the point, I guess. Of course, this analysis is solely based on publicly available information about hypersonic missiles. Maybe there are some classified materials that discuss how these missiles can travel in lower parts of the atmosphere hypersonically, without melting. But probably not. So let's talk about Mother Russia's hypersonic claims. Russians claim that they have two hypersonic missiles, Kinjal and Tsirkon. But do they really? In the case of Kinjal, it's actually an Iskander ballistic missile air-launched from a MiG-31. 
It is marketed propaganda <clears throat> as an unstoppable hypersonic weapon. If Kinjal is a hypersonic missile, so is the German V2 from the 1940s. But what about the Zircon hypersonic missile? On Russian TV, it was claimed that Zircon traveled 620 miles in 2 minutes. That would mean an average speed of Mach 24. For reference, none of the American scramjets built to date are capable of speeds over Mach 6. But forget about that. Let's just examine the footage of Zircon hitting its target barge at hypersonic speed. Not much damage for a hypersonic missile. Of course, the Russian government says that's because the missile didn't have an explosive warhead. Which is funny, because the hypersonic air-breathing weapon concept, or Hawk, is capable of traveling at Mach 5 and destroying its targets solely using its kinetic energy, which is equivalent to a few tons of TNT. But this is the impact of Sikran traveling over 620 miles in 2 minutes with an average speed of Mach 24. And this is why hypersonics is the technology of the future and will always be. <laughs> yeah, I still don't see why those engineers found it funny. <laughs>